Welcome to Real Estate 360 Live with Ryan Sloper, the trusted name in real estate radio. Now, here's Ryan Sloper. Welcome, everyone, to another episode of Real Estate 360 Live. I'm your host, Ryan Sloper. For those of you not familiar with the podcast, my guest and I will cover all angles of real estate, from interest rates to the economy to what's happening in Washington, anything that can affect you and your real estate decisions. Um, if you haven't already done so, please go to da- uh, iTunes and download, subscribe, share the podcast in the search bar. You can search Real Estate 360. Also, if you don't have access to iTunes, you can always download or stream it directly from the website at realestate360live.com. Also, on the right-hand side, there is an Ask a Question button for any questions that you may have. Um, following up from last week's show, I did have a few questions on the Fannie Mae 3% Down program, which obviously uh, would be appealing to many people that don't have much money to put down large down payments on homes. So we will touch on that later in the show. Got a lot to cover. We've got the Fed and their statement, their policy statements they came out with. Not anything earth-shattering there. Um, we will dive deeper into that. We'll talk about the Fannie product. We'll also, um, you know, talk about where we think interest rates are going for 2015. Uh, many of the of the analysts are speculating that interest rates have to rise. They have to rise. Um, mainly just because of the Fed's target goal of trying to get this 2% inflation number. And obviously, inflation is the arch enemy of bonds and mortgage-backed securities. So I want to kind of dive deeper into that. We'll get um, you know my point of view and also Lewis. Lewis is on our show each and every week, a former school teacher, a former attorney, a former general manager of a major real estate portal. Lewis is often cited in the media as a real estate industry expert in Forbes, Wall Street Journal, Fox Business, U.S. News, MSN, and numerous others. Lewis, how are you doing today, buddy? Good morning, Ryan. How are you? I'm doing well, sir. Good to have you back on, as always. Thank you for um, having me. No problem. And, it, you know, we, obviously, it, even if the Fed wasn't having a statement, we'd somehow, in, in some shape or form, talk about them, right? Because, right. as we always mention, it, it, this is a Fed-driven economy. Um, and unfortunately, that's the case, obviously, but we had the wonderful Fed policy statement, which it's not surprising, I'm su- especially to you, that the language was pretty much the same. Um, I thought that one of the things that that was in there was that they removed the considerable time uh, portion of the statement like they had in there last time. Um, and they left it in there just, just so that it was like a reference point, but that's not like something that they're still focusing on. And I know why they would do this, because once again, they, they stopped the QE program in October. They say they start to go with the mantra of it looks like, okay, the labor slide, the labor market is starting to improve. They can't continue to talk about considerable time because that would indicate that obviously we're not moving in the right direction. Right, and, good point. Right? So they, they can't continue to talk about considerable time. So now they're going to taper that. They'll leave that language in there as a talking point but or a reference point, but that's not really, you know, what what they feel um, is taking place at this point in time. They feel like the labor market is improving. So that would indicate to the markets, to the stock market, to everybody else, that it could, within the next couple of meetings, they could start thinking about, you know, raising the interest rates up. Now, you and I both talk about this all the time. We don't think that they really – can afford to raise interest rates, mainly because how in the world are we going to be able to service the debt that's out there? Um, That's problem number one. Now, they do have that, you know, the dual mandate that the Fed has there, and they got to keep inflation moving towards their 2% target. My question to you, Lewis, is obviously we know what what the oil situation is taking place. We know where the employment situation is. Do you see that there's a way to get the inflation moving in the right direction without them raising interest rates. Well, they have been threatening to raise interest rates, and you and I and others have said they can't, they won't, for a variety of reasons. It would kill the economy. In fact, Greenspan said just as recently as well, it was February, March 2013, in an offhand comment in the the testimony, he said that if we raise rate, we can't raise rates because the economy is weak. And it would uh, collapse the economy if we were to do so. Economy isn't much better, but they keep saying that it is. But but I think the most important point um, is 
they cannot raise interest rates. Now, we had said they cannot end QE because interest rates would rise. Well, we've seen they ended QE and interest rates went down. Inherent in our statements and our predictions that they could not end QE was that they could not allow interest rates to rise. So when they started talking about ending QE, if you remember, all during uh, this year, rates were rising. They were up close to 3%. We thought, oh, well, once they stop this program and they're no longer you know, buying 70 80% of the bonds, then rates would have to rise because there would not be the same liquid market buying 100% of the newly issued uh, Japanese bonds from the Bank of Japan. But it's turned out they've managed to figure out how to get somebody else to buy them, which indicates why they have to do QE in the first place if all they had to do was wave their magic wand and keep interest rates low. So the bluff has always been not whether they would do QE or not or continue to do QE or taper QE or end QE. It's whether they would set the environment to... Uh, raise interest rates, and that we're saying they cannot and will not do, not just because the harm to the economy in the U.S., but because of what everyone else is doing, Ryan. If, if right. the, the other yesterday, Swiss National Bank came out and said they're going to negative interest rates to preempt the ECB, the European Central Bank's, going to do a QE program, potentially. Bank of Japan doing a, um, a QE program. You've got deflation in the price of oil, which Yellen is saying now is a good thing. Now, of course, that goes counter to everything she's ever said about deflation and lower prices, because lower prices are supposed to be the enemy to what she's trying to do, which is create inflation. But because yeah. this is a fact in the economy that doesn't fit her narrative, she has to say, well, that's a good thing. Then yeah. consumers now have money and they can go out and, and spend it on other stuff. We could say that about anything. If prices right. were re reduced, you can go out and spend money. And that ties into the whole Keynesian economy. If you want to stimulate demand, you don't... Uh, create inflation and make prices higher, you make them lower, and then people have more money to spend it. So I don't think, Ryan, I don't think anything has changed since you and I have started talking about what the Fed's plans are. The Fed has realized that they're in a bind since 2008. There was too much debt in the system, and the only way that they can control it was by creating more debt. I want to play a clip, Ryan, because this is what Bernanke said in 2009. And keep in mind, this is 2009 when he says – on what Fed policy is. And tell me if this isn't the biggest bluff you ever heard because they're still saying the same nonsense. Ready? Yep. All right, let's play it. This so is to lend to a bank, we simply use the computer to mark up the uh, size of the account that they have with the Fed. So it's much more akin, uh, although not exactly the same, but it's much more akin to printing money than it is to borrowing. You've been printing money. Well, effectively, and we need to do that because our economy is very weak and inflation is very low. When the economy begins to recover, that'll be the time that we need to unwind those programs, uh, raise interest rates, reduce the money supply, and make sure that we have a recovery that does not involve inflation. Okay. So that's what they're going to do. <laughs> they're going to raise rates. They're going right. to unwind, not just raise rates. They're going to unwind the $4 trillion that they spent since he said this in 2009. Yep. That's never going to happen. Never, never. When yeah. he said it, they weren't that much in the hole with QE. They just started it. And, and right. back then, he's saying, we're gonna, when, when, all, when the economy begins to recover, well, according to their definition, Ryan, the economy has been recovering for years because we hear the word recovery, recovery, improvement in the labor market. And that's when they were going to stop what they were doing, raise interest rates, and unwind the program. Well, the mm -hmm. recovery, according to them, has begun for years. And they're still talking about what Bernanke was talking about in 2009. And now Yellen is talking about in a considerable period of time, in, two, in, two, in the next couple of months, next couple of meetings, whenever they're going to start thinking about it, be patient. They can't do it. And they've managed to trick people into thinking that they're in control when they're not. They're in control of telling people they're in control and right. putting off raising rates through various ways of hiding their ability to raise rates, whether it's QE, uh, stopping QE, or, or raising rates. Whatever they're going to do, they're not going to allow the interest rates to go higher. Unless, they can't. Some unless there's some external event that takes that ball out of their, their control. Right. And it's offensive, yeah. Ryan, that they have control over the entire economy when they produce nothing. They have no input into what gets – all they do is control what the cost of money is, and that ends up – controlling the entire economy. 
Right. In they a way. Manipulate. Yep. Yeah, but, but but Ryan, they don't make products. They don't provide services. They don't innovate. They just meet and manipulate. It seems kind of like um, you know all the companies pretty much on the stock market right now, right? They do. They don't really produce much of value. <laughs> they, right? They don't have to turn a profit. We talk about this all the time. I mean, it's, but you know, if they take their cue from the Fed, I guess you know they're they're right in line w- with them. It's why did the why did the market go up seven hundred points yesterday? Did companies come out with earnings? Did companies do something special to improve their outlook? No, the yelling yat talked. Exactly, and you know what's interesting about that, and I'm glad you brought that point up because when you started talking about Energy. If you remember, how scared were traders when oil was dropping down to fifty dollars a barrel? They were, they were, they were so scared because they thought that all now all of a sudden all these energy companies are going to go out of business. Because exactly, if you listen to our last podcast, if you haven't, go check it out because we talked specifically about the play um, uh, of OPEC to be able to force you know all of the all of the investment that we've been making into you know producing the, the most amount of oil in the world over here to kind of put us in a position where these companies are going to go basically bankrupt because they don't have the capital to sustain their business at $50 a barrel. So last week, everything was like hitting the fan, right? Now this week, Yellen talks. She starts saying that, oh, it's a good thing that oil prices are low because now consumers can potentially consume more. That's good for the economy. Well, and she's not worried at all. She, she, she said nothing like there's going to be any knock-on effect. You know, just like when the subprime mortgage crisis hit, oh, it's nothing. And then when it finally did hit, it was, well, it's contained to subprime. They're not even giving, what's the word, Ryan, um, any concern over the fact that there are derivatives, that there's a lot in play when oil goes down to $50 a barrel, that there's a lot of um, the 20% of the junk bond debts are denominated uh, off of the um, loaning of money to these oil companies, these shale oil companies, and that they all right. can implode and have a knock-on effect on the economy. She yeah. just it, dusted that off and just said, oh, that's a good thing. Prices are low. She changed her entire tactic on, or, or view on how, what lower prices mean. Lower prices are now good, and that, there's nothing else to say she's not concerned. If, if, if something like this happened, Lewis, in early 2000, like, uh, you know, 2002, 2003, um, and that's when I first got into the mortgage business, I remember, you know, watching as these economic things came out. Uh, on the calendar, when they came out with the data, whatever the number, what the estimated versus the, you know the actual was, you'd see like if something if oil had dropped down ten dollars or something like that, we'd see mortgage interest rates shoot through the roof, right? Like we would we don't see any like actual like the the volatility is mainly in the stock market and it's it's so temporary. It's funny because. We they they drop and then all of a sudden they can just shrug this off. They can shrug the fifty dollar oil completely off and pretend right. like it didn't even happen. It's it's so like if I actually compare it to like politics now and the, between the Republicans and the Democrats of how we can be talking about you know how the Republicans are going to basically defund certain programs because you know Obama was ramming the whole immigration thing down their throat. They're going to find another way to to get back at him. And then one week later, everybody's forgot about that. We don't even care about yep. it anymore. Right. Well, it's the same with politics. You know, back when I was when I was a kid, a political scandal basically would ruin a politician's career, be run out of office, and that's the end of it. Mm-hmm. And we've seen since Clinton. I mean, I remember Gary Hart ran for president, and there was a whiff of some extramarital affair. He was done. That's no yeah. longer the case. There is no defining moment in anything, and this has nothing to do. I'm not, I'm not talking about from a, from a moral perspective. It's just that things come and go, and if they're not in the news cycle in the last couple of weeks, they never happened. So you can start over, and, you know, there was a crisis last week. Well, that crisis was last week. It's not around anymore. Yellen spoke. Right. Yeah, and by the time, <laughs> so the, the by market's the time, fine again. There's no, there's no issues. Right. By the time, you know, this podcast is over, you know, Lewis is dead again, right? And because next week we'll be talking about how they flipped something again and made it – they can turn anything into a positive for them when they see fit. They don't want, they don't want deflation, but it's okay if it happens in the, in the oil market. Right? right, especially when you consider they spent $4 trillion, uh, printed $4 trillion to fight deflation. And now right. when it arises so effortlessly in oil prices yep. – well, that's good. Almost like they planned it. 
Well, and, and, and if the economy was actually recovering, they would not continue to reinvest the principal payments back into buying more treasuries and buying more mortgage-backed securities. They wouldn't do it. They would start. To also, they wouldn't down. wait for the next couple of meetings. Well, why wait? Yeah, there's no reason to wait. You don't even have to talk about it. Just do it. And we've always said this, right, Louis? They can just yep. talk about doing anything, and everybody on Wall Street is so, they're basically brainwashed now. And I don't think it's like brainwashed out of like you know out of stupidity or anything. It's just that they're actually being smart. Let's just follow everything that the Fed says. It's where they're bread are, and buttered. They know that no matter what they do, the market forces do not control where the stock market goes. The Fed does. Yeah, and, and would same we with gold prices. A, all all markets are manipulated so heavily that you really can't make predictions based on supply and demand, sentiment, and so on, because all those are driven by the artificial supplies that the Fed either creates or by what they talk about or how they manipulate rates or what they interject into the market, what they short sell, what they make it short sell, what they print, what they instruct foreign banks to do. It's got nothing to do with, with the regular market dynamics. I'm not not one iota, and it's I had And if the market dynamics start to show their their true colors, and they don't like what's going on, they bat it down. Or if the market starts to uh, decline, based on negative sentiment, they change that too, and they make you go back up. And they have all of the media on their side. They have basically whoever's providing you know the economic reports pretty much on their side because they always seem to come right in line with where they need them to be. Where do they Never come to... from, Ryan? Reuters, AP, Bloomberg. Those are your three big ones. What right, about the article long... I sent to you on the uh, the housing permits and the and the Oh, you mean the one sales. that headline – yeah, the headline uh, read, Housing Starts um, Permits Fall, Pointing to a Recovery, that one? <laughs> yeah. That's yeah. the Reuters uh, one. It gets picked up on CNBC and everywhere else. They actually give you the news, and then they tell you it's good that housing permits are down, that housing starts are down, that no one's buying houses, that home prices aren't going up, even though mortgage rates are lower. Supposedly we've got great job growth. We've got great GDP growth. But for some reason, no one's buying houses, but that's because there's a recovery going on. Yeah. You know, it, it bothers me because, you know, I'm out there in the markets every day, you know, obviously buying and selling real estate pretty much, you know, on, on a weekly basis. And when I'm talking to some of these other real estate agents and talking to other just professionals in general, and their comments to me are like, well, you know, I was at um, this George Mason economic summit and the, the uh, economist that was there basically has predicted that in 2015 interest rates are going to rise to the 5% range. And I said, yeah, where is he getting his information from? He's just listening to Yellen and what she's saying, and she, they're making a determination of, of what they think is going to happen based upon what she's telling them. They're not going out on a limb and actually saying, well, this has been going on for five plus years now. Why would it change? Right? Lewis, you and I have taken the approach. We, we know what's going to happen. They can talk about this all day long. It's been going on for over five years now. They can't stop the train. It's too far down the track. Well, there's right? an expression, you can't taper a Ponzi scheme. Absolutely. And, and it, it's, it's really, it, it bothers me because I get tired of of you know people touting the real estate market just because just because just because they feel like they can you know right. what we wouldn't have to say anything the numbers would take care of themselves if we had a healthy employment market if we had wages increasing you know if we had job stability uh, if if we had people that just wanted to go out and buy because they have the money and right. they see the value in a low interest rate environment. Anybody looking at interest rates at, in a high 3% range for a 30-year fix obviously would want that. Who wouldn't want that, right? Ryan, let's talk about the issue raised at the top of the show because if everything, as you say, is the case, why, for any reason, would Fannie Mae Freddie Mac institute a 3% down program to stimulate the market when all the indicators – would show that, look, we've got a low interest rate environment, we've got this healthy job growth, we've got GDP growth, everything is fine, people should have money, then why would you even think about the 3% down payment? I mean, it's crazy, you know, markets are soaring because the Fed's not going to do what they threatened for six years to end this accommodative policy to shrink their balance sheet. Why aren't they going to do that? The economy's great. It's been great for years, they've been telling us. Well, so, you saw this. 
Fannie Mae just came out with a report, Lewis, that said that their numbers were way down, right? It, it, no, it, they're it, not. Yeah. They can't be, Ryan. There's a recovery. Oh, if they are down, that's because there's a recovery too. Well, yeah, they'll make it, but they'll make a statement. <laughs> they'll have their, they'll have their, you know, chief, uh, chief economist come out and say that, you know, well, it's looking like 2015 is the year of the first time home buyer in the millennial, right? Yes, and, um, and it's going to accelerate, and they're going to come out of their parents' basements. They've been predicting that for years now. They're going to oh, yeah, drive the, the housing market, and then we had that. That report, remember a couple of shows ago, where they're talking about the people in the womb. They were going to try to have a recovery. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, we got the perfect pre-adolescence, you know. Well, it's, just think about it this way: they've been hibernating in their basement for their parents or their parents' basement for the last five years. But now, since oil has hit fifty dollars a barrel, Lewis, they can take that extra money that they have, and they can then get out of their parents' basement because then they can afford to go buy a house. Yeah. Not because they're not because they still have a job. But just because they have you know money sitting around because they're they're saving money now, right? They have oil prices have pennies. gone down before. It's overstated. They want to say that there's some wonderful impact from lower prices when exactly they don't want lower oil prices. But the amount of money that people spend on gas to drive to work, even if you do drive to work instead of taking public transport, or to heat your home, is not the is not enough to offset the rising cost of your health insurance and the loss of wages or your stagnant wages because you either lost your job, haven't gotten a raise, or working a part-time job or unemployed. It's nice to have lower oil prices, but they are temporary. They're not going to stay down. Even if they do stay down, it's not like now you can go buy a house because you're spending $12 less a month on gas. Well, and the the reality is, too, nobody wants to talk about this, but even if somebody saves 20 bucks per time that they go to the gas pump, so let's say they go four times a month, that's $80. Most people won't take the $80 and put it in their savings account. They'll go spend no. that on, on their Christmas gifts or whatever else they need at the time. So well, Also, the, food prices are up. I mean, beef is more expensive. So it's not like there's not offsetting. It may be a positive overall, but the amount of positive – first of all, $20 a week, a tank, I don't think it, that, that'd be a lot of money, wouldn't it, Ryan? You'd have to be driving yeah, I mean, a Hummer to save well, that I'm kind make, of money. I'm, make, I'm making numbers up, you know what I mean? But it, right. it, 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 I'm just saying in general if they were able to have some sort of savings, even if it's 5 or $10. Right, not but then you're talking about a much smaller number, and then it's, that right. amount becomes lost in their daily spending. You buy a Starbucks, and it's over. Right. But, you know, when, when we have a healthy market, we're not, we're not even talking about these things. It, it just naturally would happen. Like, people would be lining up in, in droves to buy real estate. It would, it would be because, you know, everybody's not worried about their job situation. All the questions that I get are, do you see this turning around? Do you see this turning around? They're reading the same stuff that we're reading, Lewis, except right. what happens is everybody gets caught up in the fact that the Fed and the president can say whatever they want, and they just have to assume that it's going to be okay. But you have I'm to not to believe your own eyes. Yeah, exactly. And, and you know what? The only people that, are, you know, that have an opportunity to thrive right now are the people that – are no longer worried about the Fed, they're no longer worried about the president, the politics and all this, and are taking care of themselves, being entrepreneurial, be, taking it upon yourself to kind of improve your own situation and not letting somebody else dictate it. Because if you're on Wall Street, if you're you know, in, a, in a job as a contractor now where it can be pulled out from under you at any point in time, you're <clears> scared. <throat> I know you're scared. So if, if you're scared, you have, your chances are you're not going to be buying a home, Right. I nope. mean, most, most of these jobs now are contracted jobs. We've talked about this. I talked about the company that went from $300 million to a billion in less than two years. Yep. A, staff, a staffing agency. Now, that's, that's not just for low-level work. You mentioned last week they even hire CEOs on a, on a uh, contract basis. Uh, absolutely. I mean, you, you, who cares if you have to pay somebody a couple hundred grand as a CEO, but it's a contracted job where, you know, if all of a sudden he's not doing what you want him to do? Guess what? They can take care of firing them. You don't have to worry about that. But that this is this is the new age of employment, Lewis. This is not this is something that's here to stay. This is not something that's just going to happen. You know, it's going to happen today and be gone tomorrow. And it's, it's not market care. driven. It's regulation driven, which is the worst possible thing. Uh, of course, it's it a is. market reaction to the health care insurance and, and all the other regulations and taxes. And just like the Fannie Mae 3% down product is a market reaction to the lack of mortgages, the lack of mortgages, right? There's not enough mortgages that they're, they're giving out right now, so they have to find a way to basically take more risk 
to get hopefully a few more people through the door. Now, everybody, I had probably three or four questions on, on um, from last week's podcast about the Randy May 3% down product. Obviously, they're rolling that out. Um, I'm still in the process of getting all the particulars because there will be some particulars. There's going to be a, a mortgage insurance component to this that's going to be pretty hefty. So your interest rate and mortgage insurance is going to be a bit more, which is going to kind of potentially offset what you would feel like <laughs> – would then be a good deal. Like if, if let's just say that the interest rate could be, and I'm making all these numbers up, but mm-hmm. let's just say the average interest rate would be 4%. If, if it's a 3% down Fannie product, by the time you have the mortgage insurance and all that, it could end up at five and a half, right? Between the higher interest rate and paying a higher premium for mortgage insurance for a low down payment like that. So it's almost like the government loan with three and a half percent down. It's an expensive loan. You're giving somebody a low barrier of entry because it's a lower down payment requirement. But guess what? Now they don't have the, the same savings as on the cost side of interest right. rate and mortgage insurance. So this is just – it's a marketing tactic, guys. It's a marketing tactic. Well, See, what you're up. saying is it's smart what they're doing as a marketing tactic, but as a practical factor, they're covering their themselves by saying, look, we're basically giving you money with no collateral. We have yep. to kind of get insured on this, and you're going to have oh, to pay for that too. Yeah, and they're going to require higher credit score requirements for a 3% down product because Fannie and Freddie are not like the government, FHA, who would lend out, you know, potentially give you an FHA loan with a 3.5% down payment at a 600 credit score. Fannie and Freddie won't do that. You've got to remember, people be- with less money generally have lower credit scores. So if you don't have the money saved, um, that's probably an indication that you're living off of credit and that you're kind of tapped out or near tapped out on your credit card. So you're not going to have that good of a credit score anyway. Because yeah. if you have a good credit score, most likely you have more money saved up. Well, you know, they've said there's been a bunch of um, articles lately about, you know, the reason why a lot of people are getting turned down for loans is because, obviously, their credit score, because of medical collections, because of all these things, these little small things, basically damage a person's credit profile and make it impossible almost for them to be able to buy a home. Now, I have, a, I have an interesting story because I just recently had a client who, uh, on the, from the real estate side, so she was purchasing a home, and she had already been working with her bank. Um, I'm not going to name the bank's name, but we've talked about them before. She, they issue her a pre-approval letter, okay? okay. They say, you know, you're good up to 400000 and so I call the bank and the loan officer, and I start basically asking questions. Okay, well, you know, this is – you've obviously gone through the entire process of collecting documents, uh, pulled the credit profile. I'm assuming everything checks out there. Is there anything that you're missing from them that you need in order to make a full decision on this file, like a pre-underwrite, right? So they did more of a pre-qualification than a pre, like, pre-approval like process of actually collecting everything, even though he told me that he had all these documents. So we go out, we write a contract. They get under contract. Goes back about two weeks into the process. This bank then says, oh, well, you were pre-qualified, but you've been denied this loan now unless you'll put down an extra $100,000, okay? Now, what, <laughs> what actually triggered this, and this is a big bank, okay? They issued a pre-qualification letter basically from just entering in information that these buyers told them verbally, <coughs> They never right. actually physically saw tax returns. They never physically saw bank statements. And even though the, the, the loan officer that I spoke with told me that he had verified all this, they had not. They had not. Because I went back to the you know, buyer and said, well, did you give them all the, doc- the written documentation? And he said, well, we didn't need that until we found the property. And this, this is a big problem because many people can say that, that I want to go and buy a home and, and they get a pre-qualification from a bank but then all of a sudden, when you get involved into the transaction, they don't really qualify. They're so far from qualifying, right? Um, so there's potential issues here. So that deal is going to be potentially dead because now it's going to have to be restructured. Um, it's probably going to take some, some repair. If there's a lot of things that are going to take place. This could be pushed six months down the road. But I think that a lot of people are led to believe that they can qualify, but actually, right. quali- you know what I mean? Believing and actually qualifying are two different things. And it's a very, um, 
long and arduous process most of the time, especially for people that have, you know, gaps in employment or, uh, you know, don't have proper documentation. I mean, we see all the time that loans are being denied for, for large deposits that people can't verify. We see that they're, they're being denied because um, of something on their past uh, credit profile that they don't have documentation for or they can't pay off a medical collection that's for two or $3,000 that they say they paid but they don't have any documentation for it. There's a million reasons why. But, like, if, if deals can just blow up for, like, these little small things, I mean, how difficult do you think it's going to be for somebody to get a fanny 3% down product if they have dings on their credit? If they have, You know what I mean? If they don't have a legitimate credit profile. So I'd love to see the statistics of the amount of people that actually get a fanny even a 3% down loan because it's going to be a very small, small minority of the people. Well, you know what, Ron? I just realized what's going to happen is pending applications uh, are going to rise dramatically yep. because yep. of this. They won't get approved, but they will point that to strength in the housing market because applications rose in the new year because the rush to try to get this 3% down product, when in reality what you're telling us is that they most of them won't get approved. And, again, that's one of the cases where you won't know that for six to eight months later when home sales don't increase. Um, but they'll show pending uh, mortgage application, uh, mortgage applications being higher. Uh, and they'll and say, you know, see, 2015 is a better year because these programs are working when they're not. You got we that won't right. know they're you not know, working. And coming right out of the gate in January, you just, we'll just watch the media because I guarantee you that's exactly what they're going to latch a hold of. These new programs which are going to throw these millennials into homes come the spring market. And yeah. – uh, you know, by the time that anybody actually has a chance to digest the real numbers would be four or five months later where they can say, oh, it snowed three feet in exactly. February. Mortgage right? applications soar in January. I mean, that'll be the headline. Pointing already, to robust uh, housing market in 2015. Millennials <laughs> finally take the plunge. It'll be all that kind of garbage. Labor slack is finally improving. Exactly. Yep. Yeah, I mean, we, we've seen this. Job before, growth right? accelerating. Yeah, it's almost like Groundhog Day for us, I believe. Like, it just goes on, like, a yearly basis. I, I, because I swear we were just here a year ago, and then the year before that, and then the year before that. Everybody thinks, you know, it's that, it's that whole, you know, insanity definition, you know, doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result. Unfortunately, for the Fed, they can't do anything different. And we've talked about that. The analysts, the economists, and everybody else can talk about whatever they think. They think it's going to happen, but the reality is it's not going to happen unless there is something outside, some external thing that happens that's so big that forces this thing to blow up. As you they and just I come up with a different twist on what they're doing, and they get people to focus on that and the efficacy of that. And then when that doesn't work, they try something else, and everybody focuses on that. And they never remember, going back to the beginning of the show, that the whole concept of Fed policy in 2009 was – we were going to be accommodative. We were going to do this little stimulus. And then once the economy began to recover, recover, we were going to stop buying bonds and printing money. We were going to raise interest rates and then reduce the stuff we bought on our balance sheet. None of that has happened. None of it. <laughs> we're, 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 we're not even close to doing any of it. And they can remove language all they want from, from – <laughs> right, That becomes action. They remove language. Yes, yes. That's it's, economics it's, now. That's how you study finance. That's that's how you know where the economy is going. Whether Yellen says considerable period of time anymore. That's it. Right. Yep. And and that's, what does that have to do with anything? It doesn't have anything to do with it. And, and they're and they know that everything is is predicated based upon what they say, not actually what happens. So as long as they continue to stay and they stick to a narrative and they just bounce back and forth, nobody wants to call the Fed a liar. I mean, they, they are a liar. They've said what they were going to do. It's not working, but they don't want to say that it's not working. They just manipulate the language to make it appear however they, they want, and everybody buys into it. Nobody yeah. in the media ch challenges them. Nobody says, hey, well, you said that when the economy starts improving, you're going to do X, Y, Z, but you haven't done that over five years. Six. Well, that's, that, yeah, six now. What, what's going to happen – you know, you said in the next couple meetings. How can you when, can you define that a little better? What what numbers do you need to see? Because I'm looking at all the numbers and they're getting worse. 
We actually yeah, but they're data-driven, and they can drive that data off any cliff they want. Absolutely. I mean, but, that, but this is the, the, the joke of it all is that they can just <laughs> say whatever. It does, they don't even have to have anything to back it up. They don't have nope. to have anything to back it up. It can just be because I said so. The Fed said so, and that's where the whole Fed speak comes into play. It's just whatever they say is the gospel, and if you don't listen to them, then you're, you're considered a looney tune. You're the conspiracy theorist. Yep, Don't they can say me. unexpected dollar strength, deflation, market drop, housing decline. But otherwise, we were going to raise rates. Well, you you do have a few people out there. Um, I believe it was – did you see – I think it was Jim Rickards um, where he's basically predicting that obviously the Fed will implement QE4 and in the year of 2016. Right, and now, on the last I, show, I, you and I said the middle of 2015 if the ECB does it. But remember, I, I told you that – I'm, I'm kind of like leery about the timing of it only because of the presidential election taking place, right? So I, 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 I well, think QE is a good thing, it, though, Ryan. That well, would help. I, it would help the Democrats, right? So I'm just – could it happen a little earlier? You know what I mean? Like I, I don't know – I feel like that we're, we're – there's nothing is good about the economy at all right now. They can make it seem whatever, but they have to reverse course. And by them starting to take out language – Maybe we're going down that path, but when 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 do you think that they would want to do this? Something like QE4. You think that they're <clears throat> they're going to late two thousand? They will do it as they're... soon as it becomes apparent. And and again, this could they can keep it not apparent through media manipulation <laughs> that the economy <laughs> hasn't recovered, and they can massage and they can you can actually have a bad fourth quarter number, and they can explain it away with weather or uncertainty over oil prices, something. So you'd really need two consecutive quarters of bad data that they can't explain away. And also, the, and also you'd have to have um, the ECB, if they do QE in the first meeting, not the second meeting of 2015, then by mid-2015, we'll have had two bad quarters, pretty obvious, no acceleration in the economy. You'll have Bank of right. Japan, ECB doing QE, the dollar would be getting stronger and stronger if people were still thinking that they were going to raise rates. They'd have to reverse pretty quickly. But see, it, to me, it would be a bad thing, actually. It would help, like, the QE would help the economy, or not, not really help the economy, but everybody would consider Help it the good. stock market. Right? But I, yeah, help the stock market. But I think it would be a bad thing for, actually, Democrats, because what would happen is, I mean, well, for anybody that's smart would just look at it and be like, well, they said everything was better. It was getting better, getting better, getting better. Why are we doing this now? That would mean that you didn't do Well, no, they can blame the that. Republicans for their, their obfuscation of President Obama's wonderful policies during 2015 and 16. No, that's the end of true, but I, I, I don't think I, there's either party can take credit or blame for the economy at this point. If it goes south, probably the Republicans would be deemed to have owned it. And no one really owns the Fed, whether it's a Republican or Democrat. The Republicans are a little more vocal and opposing the Fed, but the leadership isn't because Bush is the one who put in Bernanke, yeah. right? And, and Reagan put in Greenspan, and Yellen, you know, was, was approved by Obama. But the Republican leadership is not the same as the Republican rank and file. I mean, the Republican rank and file is basically against Obamacare, is, is, is against a lot of the stuff, uh, the immigration uh, orders by President Obama. But they're ignored by the, the Republican leadership. And, and, right. and the, the Republican rank and file is against the Fed, too. But the leadership doesn't bother with that either. Well, isn't it, isn't it interesting, too, that they, we can focus on all these other issues, but like one of the most important issues at hand is exactly what's taking place with the Fed? But nobody, we, we don't talk about it, though, because the Fed controls not only our country, it basically controls the world at this point. Um, everything is basically followed in lockstep with them, and you know what? Nobody's really going to challenge them. Nobody. And because you know why? They know that they're not going to get any answers. They can, they can say whatever they want to say, and if you have a follow-up question, they just won't answer it. <laughs> They're basically the gatekeeper to the economy because if you can control the price of money and also its supply and all of its derivatives, then yeah. you can create – it's just like if you're the banker monopoly and you have all the money, people can try to beat you. If you can just pull more money out, you can overwhelm whoever is doing a better job. So they can, they can short sell, naked short sell any commodity they want to drive the price down irrespective of the actual supply. 
They can pump money into the economy where they want to put it. They can send money to people. They can print money. They can manipulate rates. And basically, they don't have to have any productive capacity. They don't have to own any assets as long as everyone is convinced that the asset that they have, which is their currency in the dollar, they can control the entire economy and, the, and all of the markets. And manip- yeah, manipulate every market. I mean, yesterday, I believe at 4 p.m., we had gold at $1,198. We had crude oil at 54.79. The Dow Jones at 17,778. NASDAQ at 4,748. And S&P at 2,061. And we have no underlying numbers to actually support nope. where, that, where the stock market is. No, nope. the earnings, the earnings any... most of those are based on low interest rate, people buying back their own shares, driving the stock price up. The supply and demand dynamics of gold and silver do not square with their prices. You have silver in deficit. You probably have gold going into deficit at the end of this year, and yet yeah. the prices go down. So yep. there's no supply and demand dynamic. Um, the stock market is, is rising even though the, it's far faster than even what they say the economy is doing, according to the official numbers, and has been rising for, you know, it's at all-time highs as if the economy in the United States is doing better than it ever has. Right. Yeah, and and you it's know, not. What, what, well, and what's going to happen, too, is, is, like, when we went through the last cycle and all the regulations started, like, especially, like, in the, in the real estate industry for, for mortgages and how, how ridiculously hard it was, and then they started focusing on, you know, um, comp- compensation plans for, for loan officers and for lenders because that was more important to target because they didn't want people to take advantage of the consumers because the consumers, doesn't, they don't have a clue as to what's going on. And, you, and people could just force them into programs, and that was the real problem. Well, and now they focus three and four years on that, the regulation. We have a low interest rate environment now. And we can't get things moving. So naturally what will happen is we, things will start to loosen up. And we, I believe we talked about this last year, Lewis, where I said that, you know, at some point that low, the low interest rates weren't going to do anything and that it would just have to be the underwriting guidelines that started to yep. loosen up. And that's exactly what we're seeing. That's exactly yep. what we're seeing You said that. Right In now. fact, the rates have gone lower and nothing has happened. So now yep. where are they going to turn to try to goose and artificially stimulate housing demand? Yeah, they loosen guidelines up further because now, like, you can actually find where people are now willing to take risks to give people um, government loans and down to almost like a 580 score where they wouldn't touch it with a 640 before. So right. this is this is the nature of the beast. The next thing is when, when it stops moving again because that pro- this product didn't work, then they'll say, you know what, you don't need a job for two years, just one year. Give me one year and tell me that you were living in your mom's basement for the year before that and we're good to go. Right. And um, now you don't even need – um a down payment because we're going to give you that too. Yeah, and you don't is. even need to make your payments because we'll have a program that says you made your payments. So you can miss like six payments if you want to. I mean, you can, they're not fixing the underlying issue that people don't have money to buy homes. They're trying to, they're bringing in the fences and saying, look, we got to get you in a house. We got to get credit flowing somehow. We realize you don't have a job. There's no production uh, <laughs> increase in the economy, but we're just going to stimulate it through loosening credit standards and handing out credit. That's what caused the first credit bubble in the first place. But as we talked about, Ryan, you cannot stop that without a a collapse and a liquidation of debt, and that's not happening. They're just trying to continue to reflate, 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 and unfortunately they're able to do it because they control credit through the ability to control the price of money and the amount of money or currency that's in the, the system. There's well, no you know, shortage. Just, people keep thinking, well, they can't lend more money. Sure they can. There's more, there's more people to lend money to. You can lend forgiveness. You can right. lower rates. You can offer incentives. You can lend money in different areas, like you mentioned, in the cars. That, that's booming. The subprime auto loans. You can lend credit card money. There's no shortage of the ability to issue credit. Right. You can issue oh. new bonds. You can, you can do more government spending and issue more uh, government debt that will never get repaid. That whole yep. myth that people say, well, we've reached a tipping point. No, we haven't. They can pile on debt upon debt upon debt. What they can't do is stop that because that Correct. would bring everything down, and that would cause a reset and a jubilee and a, and a restructuring and a liquidation of debt. That's not going to happen until it's forced to happen. But we've seen, and Ryan, they can continue yes. to come up with more products, more QE programs, go international with it, and so on. 
Yeah, and more creative language. You and I probably never believed in our wildest dreams that this would be able to continue on as long as it has. But now that it has, it's like, okay, well, it can continue on as long as there isn't some outside thing that happens that's so big that forces um, everything to blow up. But, you know, interesting, they just came out. I wanted to bring this up, too, because many people fall in this category. They they just passed again through um, through Congress that they were basically going to extend the tax cuts for – or basically – for anybody that short sales their home for 2014, right, that were there, if they had a hardship, that they're not going to come out after them for the deficiency, right? Well, what's you, you mean that they're not going to count it as income, the amount correct. that they were forgiven? Okay. Correct. Yeah, the debt forgiveness. Um, so what's interesting about that is, is that all year long people had been asking me, well, I want a short sale, but they haven't made a decision on what they're going to do with that. And I said, yeah, they're not going to tell you the decision in front. They're always going to do things retroactive because they don't want you to do it knowing that you're going to get off the hook, right? right. So, and, and so it keeps people guessing. It makes people so, I don't know if I really want to short sell my house. I know that, you know, it, it sounds like it could be good, but what happens if I get stuck paying that? So they do it right here in December, and now we basically are almost at the end of 2014. So now everybody that would do it in 2015 has to guess, will they renew it next December for all of 2015? Right. So Otherwise, you got to sell your house this week. And, and it's not going to happen. There's no short well, sale that goes through in a week. So, no, because the bank has to approve it. Right. And, and it, this is like the, the, the craziness that takes place, and, and it, it really screws with people's minds because they never really know what's going on. And you have to not only pay attention to the Fed, but you have to pay attention to what, what bills are being passed. You have to pay attention to the regulations and compliance and all these other things and what they mean. But at the end of the day, the underlying issues, as you said, Lewis, is basically we don't have a stable job market. We don't have wage growth. We don't have any of the things necessary to actually prove that there is an improving economy. We have you don't have a real economy. economy. You have a Fed-manipulated economy, so you can't expect it to work. And But we can expect, and it's many of the – you follow gold and silver better than anybody, but – Years ago, when everybody was like, oh, this can't keep going on, this can't keep going on. So all the guys that were saying the gold prices were going to go up to three and 4000 and now that they've come way down to like 1100 they had to stop beating that drum because people were starting to look at them as if like, man, these are just like crazy conspiracy theorists, right? But what, they, what nobody really takes into account, nobody actually challenges, is that the Fed is so masterful in the manipulation that those guys had to kind of go back behind the scenes again because it was like I keep telling people that gold prices are going to go up and they say that they're not. What, you know, what's going on here? And the Fed has managed to do this with everything, everything. Yep, yep because they realize that, and, and, and there's even quotes to this effect that uh, I think during the 70s and 80s that when they were manipulating markets, they, didn't atta- they did not attack gold. And they made that mistake also when they did QE because obviously when they started QE in 2009, gold went off to the races from yep. 2009 to 2011. And they realized, well, we won't be able to do the next QE because that will be the death knell of the dollar and that will be the death knell of us manipulating stuff. So in tandem, if we're going to do QE3, which is the largest and biggest, which should have sent gold and silver to the moon, they actually started to attack it at that point because they wanted to create the concept that they were in control, QE was a good thing, the dollar was stable, and that you don't need the alternative currency of gold or silver. So that's when they smartened up and they shot it down. And now they've realized that that's what they have to do is they have to – I mean, look at the way they've created the concept of the dollar. For six years, they were the most reckless central bank ever on the planet, printing $4 trillion, and now – they're being rewarded for being prudent because <laughs> they, they have they've stopped you know they've gone a massive um, you know a killing spree for six years yeah. and now right. because they're sitting down at a desk and not killing anybody, <laughs> you know that somehow this person is no longer dangerous. Yeah, they got their house in order now. According because to someone their is language. shoplifting across the street. That's the bad guy. This is the 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 choir boy over here. Yeah. It's unbelievable because. You know if the Fed has done that before, QE1, 2, and 3, that all of a sudden they're now reformed and they're the stable, prudent central bank and they're not going right. to do it again? Yeah. And, in fact, they're going to raise rates. They're going to talk about yep. considerable time. It's almost like it's the entire transformation. People forgot. what this is This exactly what we were talking about earlier in the show. Have no attention span. They think that, well, if they're not doing it now, 
they're not going to do it again, and that they and they forgot that they ever did it in the first place. Well, we, we that's what people need to remember. They printed four trillion dollars out of thin air. It didn't yeah. work. And who's to say they're not going to do it again? Well, we talk about this all the time, Lewis. If you were to go into the bank, they give you fifty thousand dollars, and then you say, you know what, I'm going to be able to take my business to the next level with this fifty thousand dollars. But then all of a sudden, you, all that money dries up. You can barely pay your debts. You go back to the same bank. You say, I need another fifty thousand. Can you give me another fifty thousand? Okay, sure. I'll give you another fifty thousand. They give you another fifty thousand. You burn through that. And you keep going back. The, the reality is that'd be great if everybody had that, right? But the only people that have access to that are the big banks, the hedge funds, the millionaires, and billionaires. Right. Nobody else, nobody else has access to that. And that's why they're thriving in a market that's mass manipulated by the Fed is because they have access to their buddies, right? They have access to that. And the companies that are thriving are, at, are, are the ones that have the relationships with the people that can get the money. Nobody else. And that's why the middle class has basically become non-existent. They, mm-hmm. don't have ac- they don't have access to capital. So and you cannot 30... produce your way out of that issue because you can't no. have access to capital. And if you no, become I mean, a threat because you're, you're producing more – first of all, where's the, where's the money made in the United States? The financial sector is, what, 25 30 percent of the yep. economy? It's ridiculous. Yep. And then which companies do the best? Not the companies that produce widgets for a profit, but the ones that produce profits for Wall Street. Right. Like Zillow. Yeah. I mean, there's a company that makes absolutely no money, but produces tremendous returns for venture capital on Wall Street. Yeah, and I mean, if, without producing a profit, that's not important. That's why the I profit said, uh, can be measured. If a company has a PE of eight or nine, that's not very exciting. Think about it. You have a company like Zillow on the market for three years, no PE, right. price sales ratio in the stratosphere. It's all forward looking projections. It doesn't matter whether they make a profit or not, the stock you know, price goes up. Yeah, you know, I was listening to a podcast the other day. Uh, I can't remember the name of it. Maybe it's called Startup or something like that, where the guy basically walks you through like him trying to, to pitch his startup company to an angel investor. And what's interesting about it is that you listen to the angel investor, and the questions that he's asking him is basically like, okay, well, how many, how many subscribers do we need to get, right? Like what's, what's, the, what's the money plan? But then ultimately, what, what's the exit strategy? Like what big right. company do you see buying you in the next five years? So – what that basically insinuates is that there's another publicly traded company out there that's probably not producing anything that has a stock price that's through the roof that will have capital to just acquire that company. They'll never do anything <laughs> profitable, right? Right. I mean, it's, right. it's that's literally the, That's what, how you start a business today is not how do I make money doing from my idea. Well, how do I sell my idea? How do I sell my losses to Wall Street? Or how do I sell my losses to um, – you know, a larger company that's willing to overpay for this asset. Yeah, and, if indeed, and what you, if indeed is, you can even refer to it as an asset. And that's why I always refer back, Lewis. If you had an idea and you went to your bank and you, you flushed it with the first 50000 and you don't have it off the ground, they're not going to continue to give you money. So unless you they? have act- yeah, unless you have the ability to find the rich, which they run in, you know, these tight circles, which is why you always see it's like the same people that are now, you know, investors in the next new company and the next new company and the next new company because – that, that's what happens. But well, whoever knows. underwrites your, your – that's very important. It's not how good your idea is. If you're not with the right venture capital – see, those venture yep. capitalists, they can put any company, they can make up any story because of their track record if they want. They can push a non-profitable company onto Wall Street because they're owed favors for all the money they've made for them because they had Google and all the other companies that made a lot of money. They can, they can push any company out there they want. And sell it to the public, and the public will buy it, even if it loses money. Yep, exactly. I mean, so yeah, that's I mean, most important. Is, is, as, a, as a startup entrepreneur, it's not how do I make money. It's how do I get in front of the right venture capitalists? How do I get them to believe in this? Yeah, and that's pretty much like the, the podcast I was listening to for, for those listeners that are interested. I think it's called Startup is the name of it. And it's like Alex Bloomberg is his name. Uh, and he was in the podcasting world for basically uh, the NPR, I believe, This American Girl and a couple other ones. But he was like, walks you through, like literally him trying to pitch his idea to an angel investor where he's like recording this conversation live with him and what what they're saying. It's interesting for people that want to learn about that. But at the end of the day, this kind of goes to my point that the only companies that are really thriving now are the ones that actually aren't productive. They're the ones that (laughs) have access access to investors that have capital that can just, you know, write Million dollar checks, and you and know, then have other that, people bid the price up of the stock that they put money into. 
Correct. Well, that's the definition yep. of a Ponzi scheme. As the company yep. loses more money, you keep telling them, next year, next year, we're going to make money. And at some point, people even forget about next year's profit. They come up with some other metric, just like the Fed, eyeball, subscribers, whatever it is that shows growth. And therefore, right. the age, we got to buy into this. Right. The, age of, yes, the age of technology is just all about clicks. It's all about subscribers. It's and not we saw actually, that ended in 99, 2000. Yeah. Eventually, but maybe not. You know, <laughs> Investors are supposed to want um, profit, but we've seen people have been so brainwashed to think that gold and profits, things like that, are outdated concepts. Look at the, the idea of Bitcoin. The advantage of Bitcoin is it's nothing, so it can't be confiscated. So that's more advantageous than having a real asset like gold. Right. And they actually believe that. They're like, well, you can't <laughs> confiscate it. No one can take it. That's because it yeah. isn't anything. Yeah. And like, well, yep. you don't believe that uh, music and uh, digits can't be something? Yeah, they can be. You can play music. You can watch digital TV. You can't do anything with a Bitcoin. <laughs> yeah, you can't. You know, and, and they're worried, like in Russia, why people aren't flocking to Bitcoin. Well, if Russians want to get rid of the rubles, and they also want to make sure they have an asset they can trade, they're going to buy cigarettes, whiskey, vodka, right. food. They're not going to buy Bitcoin. What are they going to do with it? Protect their asset. Yeah. It, this is how people think nowadays. They have no grounding in economics. And then they know something is wrong with the system, so they create something wronger in Bitcoin. They say, okay, well, this is outside the system. It's nothing. Yeah. They can't take it. And we're all going to rally around nothing. Well, you know, the, the, the New Age economic books definitely don't put the Fed at, this, at the forefront. They don't include the Fed in their supply and demand and everything else because they would have to. In order to and, and that's the thing. In order to understand the economy right now, you need to not pay attention to anything your teacher shows you because it has nothing to do with any of that. It has everything to do with what the Fed wants, what, what the fact that they cannot derail this thing. They can't stop it. They can't slow it down. They can continue to crap, crap language, but it's not – the economy hasn't been improving in six years now. It's not going to start tomorrow. The stock market can be up. It doesn't mean that the economy has improved. That means the rich have gotten richer with the, because of their access yep. to capital and inflating stock prices, but there's – we don't. This is not like we have. It's like the industrial age or something like that. And we've been producing so much stuff. Or even right? the internet age. The early the internet, internet age. You're saying, wow, there's all this innovation, and it is right. true. You have online real uh, real uh, online um, uh, retail, online real estate. You have a lot of things that did come out of that. There were productive advances made during the internet uh, boom period. And now there's no, there hasn't been anything in the last six years that have increased people's production. In fact, you can argue things like Facebook and social media actually make people less productive because they're oh, all sitting looking at Facebook yeah. talking about the, what they did over the weekend. Yeah, there's there's more, there's studies that are done on that that more people spend more time on Facebook at work than they do actually working, right? Um, and, and, and that's and what you've had in the last five years. So if you have a job and you're at work doing that, you're even less productive. Absolutely. I agree with that 100%. And so, you know, this has been the, the, the theme, but, you know, as we always do, Lewis, we'll continue to uh, to <laughs> take the Fed speak and break it down and pass it on uh, to people, and they can kind of do with, what they want with the information. But at the end of the day, for 2015, interest rates, I think, will pretty much remain the same. I believe firmly that you will see underwriting guidelines loosen even more heading into the next election. They want to make everything look good, so they'll want real estate to look good again. So yep. they will loosen guidelines again. More people will probably be able to take advantage of them because of loosened underwriting guidelines, not because all of a sudden jobs are better. Just remember that. It's because now they're willing to take a, a bigger risk on somebody that they wouldn't give a loan a year ago. And that's going to be the only difference. You may see some stated income programs, some alternative financing that's not available right now be available next year because they're going to want to push the numbers. They don't want to have to keep coming out and saying, oh, it looks like mortgage applications are down again, mortgage applications are down again. They're down again. No, they can't have <laughs> Mortgage that applications are down. It points to recovery. That people jumped all over the first time. They won't be able to reproduce that headline. They're going to need to show mortgage applications rising. Which is exactly why you throw out a program like, ooh, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, 3% down product. We could talk about that for six months. We won't have the numbers for another five or six months. <laughs> and that gets us through 2015. We change yeah. the for Lewis. We, we know the way this goes. So yeah. we, But I will, um, by the next podcast, I will have all the details on that program so I can give you credit score requirements and all the like so that we people that 
potentially could take advantage of it will know the full spectrum of what that program entails. So I'll. It would be nice to get somebody on the show who goes through the program, applies, and see how they do. You know, I'll, I'll, um, I do have access to people that would be looking for that program, so I will see if I can arrange that. <laughs> that would be um, great. Be, yeah, I'll, I'll try to arrange that, actually. I'll write that down right now. Um, we're, uh, we're up on the end of the show here, Lewis, but I want to thank you for coming on thank again. You. It's been great, as always. If you wouldn't mind giving our listeners your blog um, so they can check that out. Sure, smallgold, S-M-A-U-L-G-L-D.com. It's uh, my blog where we cover the Fed, um, real estate, and gold and silver analysis. So please check it out at smallgold.com. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Lewis. Thank you guys for tuning in. We'll be back again next week. In the meantime, download, subscribe, share on iTunes, search Real Estate 360, or you can stream it live at realestate360live.com. Until next time, guys. Take care.